I have the privilege of commissioning Pastor Nevin. <clears throat> I'd like to invite uh, the elders of Ormiston, uh, Pastor Mike, and the elders of Otahu Community Baptist Church, the, the church where Nevin gave his life for the Lord. Clearly a church with good soil. So if I could invite you to, to come and sit in front, representing the two churches that are about to commission Pastor Nevin. And while they're doing that, if I could just hand, hand this around. So if you, if you want to put in your completed red envelopes back in here, just pass this around. Ormiston's elders as well. Where's Kiki? Yeah. And Rithia? And Pastor Nevin as well. Sorry, we almost forgot. <laughs> Mariana, you must be so proud. Pastor Nevin, today we commission you into the noble and majestic office of pastor. What does it mean to be a pastor? Well, I've only been a pastor for three and a half years, but... Um, I can tell you, uh, it is an amazing vocation. There are various metaphors for what a pastor is, but maybe the, the most important one is that a pastor is a shepherd called by God to love, feed, and lead his people. In that order, love, feed, and lead. And uh, a very experienced pastor once told me, once they love you, they let you do whatever you want. But he also said, and this is what I've discovered as well, once you love them, you will only do what's best for them. pastor is also a warrior. We engage in spiritual warfare. The enemies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil who plants lies that speak to the disordered desires of the flesh. Desires that are normalized in a fallen world. And so Pastor Nevin, you will be doing battle. The world, the flesh, and the devil. You will fight battles that are within yourself, and you will help your people fight the same battles. It's not an easy vocation, it is a war. And what on earth could this binoculars represent? Well, last Friday, I called up my mechanic because I'd serviced my car in June last year. My mechanic is this lovely Japanese gentleman by the name of Mick. Um, he always goes the extra mile for his customers, man of integrity. Well, when I called his mobile phone, someone else picked up. And I said, uh, oh. Is Mick available? And the voice at the other end of the line said, 
I'm sorry I have to, to have to tell you this, but Mick passed away in July last year in a car accident in the White Valley. He's only in his mid forties. I was shocked. One thing a pastor does is remind people that life is short and to always fix your eyes on eternity because that's where we're going. And to help God's people not be distracted by unimportant things in the here and now, but to live life in light of that one day when we're all called back home. This is a little vial of spikenard. Does anyone know what spikenard is? It was that super expensive perfume that was poured out on Jesus' feet. A friend brought me this from Jerusalem. Essentially, it's a scented oil. And the Bible, kings and prophets were always anointed with oil to represent the fact that this is not a vocation you choose. God has chosen you. And I'd like to just anoint you with this oil to represent the fact that you've been anointed by God and you will be working with God. There isn't a sermon I have written to this day where I haven't felt God has been part of it. It's unexplainable, the things that happen, the things that are given to me that relate directly to that topic. And I'd simply say, thank you, Lord. May these hands be the hands of Christ, always lifting other Lord. And finally, before I hand over to Pastor Mike to say a few words. This painting was the core of my calling. It was painted by Matthias Grunewald. It's titled The Crucifixion of Christ. And you'll see Christ in obvious agony. And John the Baptist symbolically positioned to his right. In one hand, John holds the word of God. And in the other, he points to Jesus. He points to a God who would do this for us. Nevin, like John the Baptist, and the words behind John the Baptist say, he must increase, I must decrease. But like John the Baptist, like every other pastor through the generations, since the calling of Peter, your job is to point to a God who would do this for us. And that is worth giving your life for. I can I invite Pastor Mike to say a few words? Well, good morning, Ormiston Baptist. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear that. Sorry. Good morning, Ormiston Baptist. Good morning, Otahu Baptist. Yes, Otahu were definitely louder. That's good. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. It is a wonderful, uh, special occasion. 
And I feel mighty uh, privileged uh, to be here in support of Nevin this morning. Special thank you to Pastor Santosh for your open and warm invitation and to the Ormiston Community Baptist Church as well. Bless you and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, what you have brought into Nevin's life, our, our dear brother. Uh, we, we miss him every, every Sunday, and you will feel the same when he comes over to us every once in a while. You'll miss him as well, and uh, so we'll, the, uh, the feeling will be, will be mutual. I want to thank you also to the worship team. just want to acknowledge the worship team. Could we just give them a bit of a clap this morning? That's a great job. There's some great songs, great choice of songs uh, for this special service. And I brought a, a special uh, word from God's Word, of course. It speaks well into everything that's been said this morning. And I acknowledge Pastor Santosh's words uh, this morning about the pastor and about what Nevin is undertaking here in the, in the, in the presence of us all, and in the presence of God and witness. To these things. They are no small thing. And what we have is just God's word is no small story. It's a story that's been going on for centuries now. And you and I, in the small droplet of water into a larger bucket representing our lives, are able to take part in God's story in this world, and as Pastor Santosh said, our focus into eternity. A story that, in a sense, is like the never-ending story of that wonderful fantasy kind of children's movie and story many, many years ago now. And I'm going to read from the prophet Amos, the last few verses, really, I guess it's from verse 11 to 15. It's the last words from this prophet. And, and as I speak to, to Nevin in regards to the commissioning today and to us all, I was reminded that when I was a boy, which doesn't seem that long ago now, when I was at school, when I used to pick up a storybook, a novel or something like that, I would often make it the practice of reading the last chapter first. I'm not sure, maybe you did the same. I wanted to know how the story ended. And so when I was reading the first chapter, second chapter, third, fourth, and so on and so on, the details of the story would all make sense because I knew how it all ended. And all the pieces of the puzzle of the story, the adventure, or whatever the case may be, all seemed to make sense and add up because of how things finished. And the, the end made sense because the details were speaking into the end, the last, the last chapter of the story. And so, Nevin, as we think about how the story finishes, the details along the way, the chapters, can make sense in a world that is very confusing at times, chaotic at best sometimes, you might say. But the story ends well because of God. The details along the way in which you may spend a number of years of your life, my life, working out the details and questioning why this and why that, well, eventually it all makes sense because we know how the story ends. In God. And so the prophet Amos says this to the nation of Israel, and beautifully it doesn't just mention that particular nation, but it mentions a representation of all other nations that are under God as well. The prophet says this from verse 11 and chapter 9 In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares 
the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed. It's representing a form of harvest where the beginnings and the endings of the season seem to be intertwined. There's so much goodness going on. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and shall drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given to them, says the Lord your God and my God. See, it's a wonderful, comforting thing to be able to know how the story ends. And so praise the Lord, I've been a part of the details of Nevin's story. And you are too. And so this is something that we're doing together. Ormiston Baptist and Otahu Baptist, it's a wonderful, it's a privilege. It's something that you would have to agree with me doesn't happen every day. Would you agree? It doesn't happen every day like this. But we, together, are part of the story, of the details, and we are working with our binocular focus on the things of eternity for the expected end and to the glory of God and of His Christ. And to all this we say, Amen. Amen. Could I just pray for a moment? Father, we just pray over this word that you have spoken into our hearts this morning. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed to us the end of the story. And we thank you, Lord, particularly this morning, that we, that we are all part of the details of this particular chapter, on this particular morning, in this particular place, for this particular brother, our dear brother, Nevin. Father, we pray you indeed continue to use him. Lord, continue to guide him. And Lord, help us as the body of Christ also to understand the importance and the significance of these things until you bring the story to the closure and we look forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be faithful until that day. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now move into the formal commissioning part of the service. Um, Pastor Levin, can I invite you to stand? So I'm going to um, go through a few key affirmations and ask Nevin to respond. And at the end of it, I will ask you, the congregation, um, uh, for your blessing and affirmation of Pastor Nevin. But these words come and are spoken on behalf of the Baptist movement of New Zealand. My brother Nevin, you have sensed the call of God to service in the ministry in his name. It is my responsibility to remind you of what this call means. The call of God is both gift and task. It comes from the depths of God's love for the world and asks us to join with God in the work of saving the world. We are called as friends of Christ, co-workers with God, followers of the Spirit in the one mission of the one God to the world. The call of God places responsibility upon us we are called to proclaim the kingdom, to nurture the weak, to feed the hungry, to bring light to the darkness, liberation to the oppressed, and healing to the broken. We are called to go forth from our complacency and risk ourselves in the mission of God. 
we are called to follow Jesus Christ our Lord. Finally, the call of God requires commitment. We stand on the heritage of the past. In the face of an unknown future, we are called to respond. By our work, we commit ourselves in our weakness and unbelief, trusting in the power of the living God. I now invite Pastor Nevin to say a few words about his sense of call to be a minister of the gospel. Very basic, to make God known and to know God, to share that message through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Simple as that, to the ends of the earth where God will be with me. We have heard your call, Pastor Nevin. It is my responsibility to ask Nevin some questions to clarify his convictions so that we may clearly understand the spirit in which he approaches ministry. Pastor Nevin, recognizing the gifts you have to offer in ministry, as we all know, they are many, we desire to recognize the call God has placed upon your life. You have been set apart as a person in whom we have confidence and trust to be a minister. Here in the sight of God, I ask you, do you affirm again your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ as the power of God to bring new life to all who believe? I do. Will you seek to so order your relationships, your thoughts, your words, and your actions that at all times you will be an example of the gospel you proclaim? I will. Will you make it your aim in all your service to seek the leading and empowering of the Holy Spirit so that the name of Jesus Christ and his name alone will be glorified? I will. As you have heard the word of God read and acknowledge these responsibilities, will you also encourage the people of God in their love for Jesus Christ and his word? I will. Will you seek to lead them by your example? I will. Will you commit yourself to a ministry of spiritual and moral caliber within the family of Baptist churches in New Zealand and to work with the body of Christ? I will. Will you seek also to ensure your own spiritual health and well-being? I will. Now it's your turn, my brothers and sisters. Having recognized the call of God on Nevin for ministry, I ask you, the members of this congregation, of which Nevin is an integral part, to give him due honor in the Lord as God's worker among you, and to be faithful in prayer for him in his ministry. Will you promise to stand by Nevin in his work, sharing with him in every possible way by your presence, support, and practical endeavor? Will you also agree to pray often for Nevin, and for whatever area of ministry the Spirit of God leads him into? If so, will you signify your agreement by standing? Pastor Nevin, in the light of what you have affirmed and the promises you have made, I finally ask you to minister always in the name of Jesus Christ. Proclaim the truth lovingly and fearlessly. Call us to live for the kingdom of God, to keep our eyes on Jesus and the word of God in our hearts, to be an example by your own faith, Remembering that in all you do, you are pointing to Christ. And therefore, 
in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We commission you as Associate Pastor of Ormiston Community Baptist Church to love, feed, and lead God's people in the name of and for the glory of Christ. Amen and congratulations. You may be seated. I will now invite the elders of both churches to lay hands on Pastor Nevin and, and pray, pray for him and bless him. So uh, let's do that. Can I start with you, Pastor Nevin? Father God, as we settle in a, a time and focus of, of prayer, we commit our brother Nevin, our pastor Nevin. Lord, I thank you for his willingness. I thank you, Lord, for his servant heart. I thank you and acknowledge the gifts, and talents, abilities that you've poured into his life to enable him to carry out the service for the, which you have called him to do, for which this church, almost in Community Baptist Church, has acknowledged, and us also from Otahuhu. Lord, we commit this brother into your hands, into your keeping, and to give you thanks. And Lord, even as Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches, and without me you can do nothing. But in him we will go and we will bring and bear much fruit. Lord, for the times where there is pruning necessary, where there is times of blossoming in Nevin's ministry, the ministry of this church, Lord, may you continue to strengthen us in, in faith, in courage, in the knowledge of your word of truth. So, Lord, that we would walk side by side with each other and with you. We're also reminded, as Jesus said, if you desire to be my disciples, just take up your cross daily and then come and follow me. The Lord, we go through times of trials and testings and hardships. Lord, we thank you. You stand by us all the way. So stand with Nevin on this commencement officially of this journey. We thank you and we, we acknowledge all the people that have poured into his life uh, for this ministry part of for training and teaching and testing. I thank you for Pastor Santosh and the elders of this church and for all the congregation, Lord, that contributes to the Nevin's work and to Nevin's life. And may you bless them all. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, can I invite the elders to gather around Nevin? Maybe we'll just lay hands on him and, and pray that way. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Nevin. Thank you that you, dear Heavenly Father, have never let him out of your sight. There have been some hard times for Nevin, dear Heavenly Father, but you have brought him back into the fold. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray and give thanks to it. And we now know, dear Heavenly Father, that he is well on the way to be serving you. And this is such an amazing job, dear Heavenly Father. And he has the talent to do that here in the Armstrong. And these things we ask for. Amen. Dear Lord, this is not the end of Nevin's journey, but a new beginning. Lord, we pray for Nevin in his new beginning. And we pray that he will spread your word not just to this ch church, but all across the people he meets. Lord, you know Nevin, you know the journey he's been on, and we pray that you'll keep him on this journey. In your name, amen. Our Father, we thank you that life is here. 
whenever or wherever he goes. You can feel his joy, his happiness. He brings all this to us. Thank you that he serves you with his loyal heart. May you give him the spiritual wisdom and strength. Continue to serve wherever he goes. Thank you. Amen. Heavenly Fathers, now we got the new pastor for, for our church. So we just hand him to your hand, your mighty hand, God. We trust in you. And I pray that Levin he take the word and he can live it and he can show his life through the word of God. And he believe what he preaching, believe and anyway, anything that happened, think God first, seek God first, and he will provide through his God. So we hand you to your mighty hand and uh, whatever he preach. In the will of your God, not our will. In your way, like you give to Moses, you give to Joshua, you give to David, you give to any Jacob, that the way that he, you use your servant. So I pray, and please guide him in your way, God. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you for. Uh, Pastor Nevin, for his love for you and for your people. Pray that Holy Spirit will anoint him in a mighty way today and the day is ahead. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you've blessed us with. The day of bringing forth and commissioning our brother, our Pastor Nevin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for his life, for his love, and the enthusiasm he has for you. Thank you for his enthusiasm in preaching, in teaching, in singing, in leading, and in worshiping you, Heavenly Father. Bless him all the days of his life, and go before him wherever his ministry leads him. All for your kingdom, Heavenly Father. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. I just thank you so much today for this opportunity to um, set apart Nevin for your ministry. And thank you for this, um, these churches that are, we've gathered together today. I just pray for, for Nevin, Lord, that as he goes into the future, Lord, that he'll keep his eyes totally fixed on you. Lord, I pray, pray that you'll um, protect him and guide him in all the decisions and all the um, steps that he takes as a pastor. Lord, um, as we've talked about this morning, Lord, um, you've gifted um, Nevin in so many ways, Lord, I can pray that you continue to gift him, especially in preaching the word, especially in feeding the sheep. Lord, just be with him, guide him and help him um, right through his ministry. We ask this in Jesus' name. Let's give Nevin one final round of applause. Well, thank you for your faithful servant. As he opens your holy word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts and minds transforming lives. May your words fall on good soil, soil that is hungry for the word of God, soil that is receptive, and soil that seeks to put these words into practice. Bless Nevin as he ministers to your people in Jesus' name.
Testing, one, two, wonderful. Well, who would have thought I had this many friends? Um, I was going to share a testimony of myself, and I thought pretty much everyone in this room knows my story. Um, so we're going to bypass a bit of that, uh, but it's, it'll be in here a little bit. Now, I have the, had, had the privilege of uh, leading you in worship through uh, singing. Now I get to lead you in worship through the preaching of God's holy word. Now, I really like to stress and emphasize the fact that this is an absolute fact, God's holy word. And although penned in by finite and fallible man, God chose ordinary men to, to reveal extraordinary things. And other than the fact that it is by faith that I believe in this God of the Bible, I believe that the Bible, I believe in the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses that report to supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claimed that their writings are divine rather than on human origin. So when I say that this is the word of God, this is exactly the word coming from God Almighty. Let's take that seriously to heart and realize that this sermon today is about what God has to say. And as I was thinking of about bringing the word this morning, I wanted to share that this is about my 25th sermon preached approximately, which isn't really that many. However, it's taken me approximately, at minimum, 25 hours per sermon, which is around about 625 hours of sermon prep, not including the rehearsal in front of a mirror like a bit of a weirdo. With all that being said, I was reminiscing of the great times that I spent at Waihi, which is the church that I've uh, preached my most consecutive uh, sermons, and um, of course my home church, which interestingly enough is also known as OCBC, which I think we've been able to establish that so far. Um, and this would be my third year here at Ormiston. So having the opportunity to preach uh, nearly to everyone in the world that means something to me, I had to share my greatest passions. And the first, of course, of all is the Lord Jesus Christ, whom is at the center and the forefront of everything that I think of, that I am a part of. And also, of course, that will be exemplified today as we go along um, in our text. So at the heart, at my heart, is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the doctrines that support that biblical teachings. So we're going to get a little bit of the brain juices flowing this morning with a fair few, fair few uh, theological doctrinal terms being used, but I will simplify them as we go along. Um, but what intrigues me is that they are all centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. Doctrines like uh, reconciliation, substitutionary atonement, imputation, and of course the five solas. Sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christa, sola scriptura, and sola dia gloria, which in the Latin term and summarized very nicely and neatly is we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, according to scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. Now not all of these terms will be mentioned, but uh, they will be, they shouldn't be far away. From, the, from your thought as we go through our text. And a doctrine of importance, specifically today, is the doctrine of justification, or more accurately, justification by faith alone, uh, sola fide. So justification in a general sense is just understanding the fact that it simply means uh, something made right with something uh, you did wrong. But we must take this more seriously and see what the Word of God says. So if you would... Kindly, please stand with me as I open the Bible this morning. And if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians from chapter 5. We stand reverently to read the God, Word of God this morning. Second Corinthians from chapter 5, we'll start at verse 17. But of importance, we'll hyperfixate, we'll hyperfocus on verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 21. The word of the Lord says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Please be seated and let me pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Hide me, O God, in the shadow of your cross so that you may be glorified and your church may be edified. I pray this in the most holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this uh, sermon entitled this morning is The Glorious Gospel, because the gospel is so glorious. If you can grasp it. There's a simple way that I could share the gospel this morning, and that would be John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel in a few seconds. Or maybe the longer version of the gospel that I share in less than three minutes that uh, I share during uh, street evangelism. It goes something like this, because Adam and Eve sinned against God, the fall of humanity started, which now we can't help but sin, uh, and because we all have lied and stolen and looked with lust and so on and so forth, because of that truth, we can't be with God. Yet God did something amazing through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for the sin of the world, and if we but repent and trust in Christ's work, we will be saved. That is the gospel and summed up version of my three minutes beer. We'll be looking at the gospel a little bit more intently than that this morning. Um, By the way, the gospel means good news. And don't we need some of that from time to time, especially if you're looking at the news on TV these days. Point to add, at the heart of the gospel is the doctrine of justification by faith alone, meaning apart from any kind of works that you think you might be able to do to earn anything. So let's get stuck in. Starting with verse 17, Paul says, therefore, meaning because of what I've already explained to you in verse 15, that he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, for their sake, died and was raised. Because of that, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. God's grace and mercy is wide enough to cover anyone, even the most vile and wicked sinners like myself. That's good news. God is the only justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. As Jesus' substitutionary death becomes the believer's death, and therefore Jesus' resurrected life becomes theirs also. You've seen the Hunger Games? Yeah? Yeah? Katniss Everdeen offers herself as tribute to be in place of her sister where the game is you've got to fight to the death in an arena and the the last man standing wins. Well, in a similar sense, when when I say Jesus' substitutionary uh, atoning death, um, in this instance, it's a very similar thing, but it's talking about the whole world that he dies for or how I prefer to say it, a whole world of believers. As we continue on in our text, the old things have passed away. That's old ideas, old plans, old loves, old desires, um, old beliefs, and they are replaced with new things, new things that God plants in us, such as new desires, new loves, and new preferences. And when these new things are nourished and developed, they help us gain victory over the battle of sin, and they conform us to the image of Christ. The next three verses use the words reconciliation five times, clearly emphasizing that there's something very important in this word and that that word holds. That is the simple fact that sin has devastated the relationship that humanity has with God, yet it can be restored. Can be restored, that's amazing news. So for those who are enemies, can be his friend. Paul says in the first chapter of Romans, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So you see, the gospel is powerful and by faith reconciles us to him, that is God. Verse 18 says, all this or all 
all these things, which again points back to what has been said, uh, which describes the total transformation taken in, the conversion seen in verses 15 and 17. All that, that comes from God and that comes from God alone. The drastic transformation in my life for someone who loved their sin, who loved darkness rather than the light, it can only be described as a born-again supernatural experience that came from God alone. That, that just can't be explained any other way. Sinners cannot be reconciled to God on their own terms. Unregenerated people or people who are not born again or people who do not truly believe in God do not have the ability to appease the anger that is stored up when we sin. Nor can we satisfy his holy justice, which, if he was to be fair and just, it would leave us with no hope in hell. So if you don't get the gospel, if, if you don't get the good news of what Jesus Christ has done and what he offers, today is the day that you must believe, for it will determine where you spend eternity. For all my loved ones, this will not be the first or the last time that you hear this. But I've heard it being said, and I'm saying it to you, if on the day of judgment we lock eyes, you can't tell me that, uh, why didn't you tell me this important news, this uh, eternal implications that it could be having on me? You can't tell me that because even my loved ones, people that I, that I know, people that I see on the street, I cannot help but want to share this amazing, life-changing news. We continue, it says, God reconciled us to himself. That is the good news of the gospel. We couldn't, we can't, but that's why God came along and he did and he does. Paul wrote in Romans 5, 9, 11, Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We are reconciled through Jesus Christ, which has been God's plan all along. God has always been the reconciler and the sinner, the reconciled. Therefore, reconciliation is not something that you do, but what you, what we receive. Furthermore, reconciliation does not ha happen because we decide to stop rejecting God, but when God reveals himself to you. This is one of my favorite verses in Matthew 16, 15 to 17. Here comes the Calvinist out of me. He said to them, but who do you say that I am, Simon Peter? Jesus speaking. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It is only reconciled people, therefore, that God gives the ministry of reconciliation. This is taking on the Great Commission in Matthew 28 to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth, and he will be with us wherever we go. Now, there are two main views of world, and it's in this context that it can be used. Either the, the world is referring to everyone and mankind in general and therefore possible for all, or either world of believers, which would mean that Christ's reconciliation was definite and absolute and for those who would believe. Now, the last portion of there, verse 19, says, not counting their trespasses or their sins against them reveals the meaning of reconciliation is the forgiveness of sins. Only when sin is removed from the sinner can the sinner be made right with God. Simple as that. Since sin that separates sinners from an eternal and holy God. Have you heard this before? God doesn't hate the sinner. He hates the sin. But it won't be the sin that ends up in hell. Something to think about. Paul says... Now to all those whom God has reconciled, God has committed the word of reconciliation. This is more than just a synonym of message, but logos in the Greek word, which indicates what is true, what is trustworthy, as opposed to myth. Verse 20 says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Also in our day, uh, being an ambassador, even in the first century, was important. An ambassador is both uh, a message for 
a messenger for or a representative of the one who sent them. So we, the believers, are ambassadors of Christ. So if you are an ambassador of Christ, it is though God would be appealing to the lost through you, through them, the believer. Finally, from verse 20, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We implore you means we earnestly beg, we plead, we ask you, please see reason. Not for our benefit, but for yours. It is Christ that is calling you. And as an imperative command, it should be read, be reconciled to God. This is begging is to be, for people to be reconciled or made right with God is clear. Sinners will never be safe from the wrath of, and judgment to come until they respond to the truth of the gospel through the means, once again, God provides. Faith. Jesus says in John 6, 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Therefore, God is the justifier of the one who has faith. In Jesus, Romans 3, 26. So now that we've gone through what you could say, the contextual analysis or the introduction to the message, let's read this powerful verse in verse 21. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God says, for our sake, God lacks nothing. He has all he, he's had all he needed from eternity past and future, before the universe was created until he is no more. He is self-sufficient, but yet he wanted to share his love. And for our sake, he does something special. And if you've been listening, you know what that is. But what could it or what does it mean for you? And before I re reiterate the good news, we have to know the bad news. Well, why do you say that? Because if I told you the good news without the bad news, there's some insight that you may need to know. And how is that? Well, if you can't recognize that you're a sinner, as a matter of fact, if you can't recognize that you are so unholy, so sinful in comparison to Christ, that is, then we deserve hell or separation from God. Actually, not only would we deserve it, but we would end up there, in hell, where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. If you failed on the Ten Commandments once ever, you're damned forever. Does that sound scary? Well, it should. And even though that's true, David laments in Psalm 51.5, Before I was brought forth in my iniquity, and in my sin, did my mother conceive me? He's saying, even in my mother's womb, before I could do anything, I was conceived, I was born into sin. And how does that happen? Well, the answer is in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 21. Paul contrasts Adam and Christ as the two representative heads of humanity, which sheds light on his intent in uh, chapter 5, 18, which we will come to. But just as Adam's actions affect all men, affects all humanity, also Christ's actions affect all those who are in him. Just as Adam's actions affect all men who are in him, which is all humanity, so also are Christ's actions affect all those who are in him. Again, this should be terrifying if you don't if you believe what I'm what you're hearing, and especially if you aren't in Christ. So what can you do? Where can you turn? All religions of the world, bar true biblical Christianity, says that take what you know that is right and fix yourself with it. Even many Christians or self-proclaimed Christians, they say take the law, take the Ten Commandments and fix yourself with it. Be a good person. Go to church. Read your Bible. But none of those things save you. However, the Ten Commandments are instead like a measuring rod, indicating that we've got some serious issues. Or it's like a mirror. When you look at it, you see all your imperfections. Like if there was something in your teeth, for example. But 
Do you take the mirror off the wall and try and take the bit of thing out of your teeth? No, that would be stupid. You wouldn't do that. It'd be idiotic. That would be foolishness. And again, forgive me for saying, but stupid if you think that you can save yourself by following the law of the Ten Commandments or having any remote thought that you're a good person because the true definition of good is moral perfection and there's none of us that are morally perfect. So what do we do? Who do we need? Well, we, I've said it multiple times, but you're going to hear it again and again. Simply put your faith in Christ. And what are we putting our faith in Him about? Let's continue and we'll see what the text, this very important text says. So we've, said, we've seen, for our sake, He made, God made, whose plan of reconciliation was always going to go this way. Not as a backup plan because Adam had failed or plan A didn't work. God made, which means he initiated everything that was about to happen, that is happening. God's plan of reconciliation, of course, is taking of Jesus and going to the cross. But let's not be confused here. Jesus Christ did not go to the cross because his people turned on him, though they did. He did not go to the cross because religious leaders plotted against him, though they did. Nor was it the betrayal of Judas, the angry mob who yelled, crucify him, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, though they done, they did all these things. Jesus went to the cross willfully and as an outworking of God's plan to reconcile sinners to himself. Only God could design an atonement or payment of sins that would satisfy the demands of his justice, appeasement of wrath, and be consistent with his love, grace, and mercy. For our sake, God made him, that is, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the God-man, the only Son of God, who is the author and finisher of our faith. After presenting Jesus as the absolutely holy substitute for sinners, the text makes a remarkable statement that God made him to be sin. Now we need to be uh, understand this phrase very carefully. I don't want to be stoned to death here. It does not mean Christ became a sinner. Jesus was the unblemished lamb while on the cross, personally guilty of no evil. Christ was not made a sinner, nor was he punished for any sin of his own, for he knew no sin. He never sinned. Instead, the Father treated him as if he were a sinner by charging his account the sins of everyone who would ever believe. Let me read that again. Instead, the Father treated him as if he were a sinner by charging to his account the sins of everyone who would ever believe. All those sins were charged against him as if he had personally committed them and, as, and he was punished with the penalty of, the, of them on the cross, experiencing the full fury of God's rash, wrath unleashed against them all. It is crucial there to understand that the only sense which Jesus was made sin was by imputation. It is crucial, therefore, to understand that the only sense in which Jesus was made sin was by imputation. Imputation means accrediting or transferring something. In this instance, a transferring of sin to Christ. Although he was personally pure and holy, he was made culpable and guilty. But in dying on the cross, Christ did not become evil like we are, nor do redeemed sinners become inherently as holy as he is. God credits believers' sins to Christ's account and his righteousness to theirs, which is a double imputation. I'll read that again. God credits believers' sins to Christ's account and his righteousness to theirs, which is a double imputation. As the late R.C. Sproul says and makes a good point, not only do we need forgiveness of sins, but righteousness. And because we haven't done anything to obey the law of God, which is what righteousness requires, Christ's imputed righteousness is just as necessary for salvation as forgiveness of sins. The only one who knew no sin could bear the full wrath of God against sins of others. Therefore, the perfect person that was the perfect sacrifice for sin, who would be a human being for only a man can die for another man, yet, of course, he would also have to be God, for only God is sinless. 
for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, those that are new creations, those that are new creatures, and now ambassadors, and for Christ, what? We again be believers and benefactors of God's imputation and completed atoning work on the cross, what? Might become the righteousness of God. We have become the righteousness of God because there is no righteousness in humanity. But through true faith in Christ alone can the righteousness which comes from God be given to us on the basis of faith. The very righteousness God requires before us, he can accept the sinner is the very righteousness that he provides. Because Jesus paid the full penalty of, penalty of believers' sins, God no longer holds them against them. We experience the blessedness of forgiveness solely by faith in the completed redemptive work provided by Jesus Christ. This is the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. And let's establish a few things. First, what is justification by faith? To put it plainly, justification by faith alone comes from Romans 4. As Paul turns to God's dealing with Abraham to illustrate the gospel has ancient roots. In verse 3, he cites Genesis 15, 6. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. God imputed or transferred righteousness to Abraham by means of Abraham's faith. His work had absolutely nothing to do with it. For Paul goes on to say, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who is justified, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. What is it about faith that makes it so suitable to be the instrument through which we receive justification? Well, Paul, again, gives us that answer. In Romans 4.16, where it makes a comment that exposes the inner logic of salvation. He says, For this reason, it, that is salvation, is by faith, in order that it may be accordance with grace. In other words, there is something inherent in the nature of faith that uniquely corresponds with the free gift of God's sovereign grace. Later in Romans, Paul says that it's works, if works have any part of salvation, then grace is no longer grace. Therefore, when repentant sinners acknowledge their sin, affirm Jesus as Lord, truly trust solely in the completed work on their behalf, God credits his righteousness to their account. As I begin to close. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he lived our lives with our sin so that God then treats us if we live Christ's life of pure holiness. Sinful life was legally charged to him on the cross as if he had lived it, so that his righteous life could be credited to us as if we lived it. That is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. You also got the double doctrine of imputation, reconciliation, and the immeasurable, crucial, urgent proclamation of the true and only gospel of Jesus Christ. So my brothers and sisters, I plead with you this day, right here, right now, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. Repent from your sin and turn to Christ in faith now before it's too late. Please bow for me in prayer. Almighty God, we are so grateful that we've been able to hear your word this morning. You are so good to us. The immeasurable gospel that has been preached this morning exemplifies you. You are holy. You are good. You are our redeemer. And I just pray that these words penetrate the heart and not just the ears. That today will be the day of salvation. Burden our hearts with this message. Transform us. May we leave differently today, glorifying God. I pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.